So thank you all for logging on today. I see a lot of familiar faces, or I did before my screen was <laughs> up in front of me. Um, and it's nice to see you all again. Um, I miss you. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Georgia. I'm the OER and instruction librarian at the Midtown campus for Toro. Um, and I'm hoping to get the recording of this webinar and the slides out by early next week at the very latest. So please watch for that. And if you need something copyright related in the meantime, just let me know or Sarah. Um, Please remember to keep yourself muted during the presentation, um, but I'll check for questions and um, set for questions a couple of times during the presentation. Um, we'll be watching chat throughout the presentation, so if anything comes up, feel free to put it in there. Um, and as I mentioned during Tuesday's talk, I have two loud dogs. My parents have two loud dogs, so if they bark, I'll just mute it and come back really quickly as possible, as quickly as possible. Um, okay, so if you're here for copyright in your classroom, copyright for your classroom, you're in the right spot. That's the topic. Um, I just wanted to do a quick disclaimer. The content in this presentation is not legal advice, nor am I legal counsel to any party. I have not gone to law school, did not pass the bar. I'm not a lawyer in any sense. Um, and this presentation is for informational purposes only. Um, so here's the agenda. If there are topics you want to go into more in depth, just um, let me know when we pause for questions at any point. Um, so what is copyright? How long does it last? How can you copyright your work? And what are author's rights? How can you use copyrighted work? Um, what are the checks on copyright? So where can it be more flexible? Um, copyright in the physical and online classroom. Copyright during uh, COVID-19, the coronavirus crisis, and then a few of the commonly asked questions and a scenario, and then time for questions, of course, at the end. Okay, so what is copyright? And I wanted to clarify that this is just United States copyright. I have very little idea of copyright for other countries, um, but if something comes up, I can try to find the answer, so just let me know. Um, Copyright comes from Title 17 of the US Code and protects creators of original works of authorship. And so even though copyright is singular, it's actually a set of exclusive rights. The right to reproduce the work, the right to create derivative works, like adapting a book into a play, uh, the right to distribute copies or transfer ownership of the work, the right to perform the work publicly, the right to display the work publicly, the right to perform the work publicly via digital audio transmission if it's a sound recording. Copyright applies to creative works and to scholarly works, and it's separate from other intellectual property protections like patents and trademarks. So it's totally separate. Not totally separate. They're all intellectual property protections, but it is separate. Um, and why do we need it? The core idea is to protect creators, as the um, little quote at the top says. The US Constitution reads that copyright exists to, quote, promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited time to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. And so I wanna talk about, like it says, limited time. Copyright protection begins as soon as a work is fixed in a tangible form. Neither publication nor copyright registration are required for a work to be copyrighted. Um, for works created in 1978 or after, copyright for individually authored works lasts for the life of the author plus another 70 years. So it um, lasts for 70 years after the author dies. Um, and then you can see for jointly authored works, it's the last surviving author plus 70 years. And for works for hire, anonymous works, and student, I wrote down how to pronounce this, pseudonymous works. <laughs> It's 95 years after publication or 120 years after creation, whichever comes first. Um, and these lengths were chosen so that creators and their heirs can seek reasonable profit for their work, while also ensuring that eventually the work will join other creative works that artists can build on and update to create new artistic works. What happens after copyright protection ends? Um, it can be renewed for a second term of protection but if it is not, or if it's unsuccessfully renewed, 
the work enters the public domain. The Stanford University Libraries explain the public domain as, quote, creative materials that are not protected by intellectual property laws, such as copyright, trademark, or patent laws. The public owns these works, not an individual author or artist. Anyone can use the public domain work without obtaining permission, but no one can ever own it. And that gets a little hairy because what about something like Sleeping Beauty, where the work might be in the public domain and the movie version that Disney created might be copyrighted. Um, so it does definitely get hairy, um, but if there's something specific that you wanna use, I would look to the original to see if there's a public domain work um, versus building off of or using the copyrighted work. Um, but if you have specific things in mind, again, that's kind of the whole thing about copyright is there are all these rules, but until you have a test case, you don't really know how it will play out. Um, so how do you copyright your work? So you've created something and now you want to protect it. What do you do? As I mentioned in the previous slide, copyright protection begins as soon as work is fixed in a tangible form. That work does not need to be published and you do not need to register it with the US Copyright Office. So an idea you had as you were falling asleep last night is not copyrightable. But if you write that down, it is now under copyright. And just to clarify, a fixed medium, a fixed tangible medium is something that is quote, sufficiently permanent or stable to permit it being perceived, reproduced or otherwise communicated for a period of more than transitory duration. So even though some people might say like a Word document is not something you can hold, um, it's, it meets this criteria of sufficiently permanent or stable. So assume that if you've written it down online, that works. Um, a lot of people see the word copyright and think of the C in the circle icon um, accompanying, accompanied by someone's name and maybe the date. And while that can be helpful to include, it is optional. A work can still be protected by copyright without that notice. Um, and I just wanted to put the link there. You can see it on the bottom. And when I send out the slides, you'll be able to click around in it. Um, but that's the link to register works with the US Copyright Office. Um, but again, I wanna emphasize, you don't need to register it for it to be copyrighted. Um, and so author's rights. When you're publishing your research in a scholarly journal, you usually sign a contract with the publisher outlining who will control the copyright. And what I failed to mention before is that you can split those copyrights. So an, uh, you might own most of the copyrights, but then a publisher says, I get to keep the rights to distribute it. So of that set of rights, you can kind of split them up or you can share them. It can get hairy when you're signing a contract. And again, we aren't legal counsel, but um, if you want us to help advise on contracts, we can definitely look them over and share our thoughts. Um, so blah, blah, blah. In some cases, the publisher may want to take all of your rights. Well, in true open access journals, for example, they may only ask for the right to publish your article first. Um, I just wanna to touch on this topic briefly before moving on. Um, to, to find publishers rules, the first place to look is a publisher's website. Another great place to look, and I will share the link when I share the slides, is Sherpa Romeo. Um, and they can show you what rights you would have as an author with a special emphasis on whether you can self archive or share your work in an institutional repository. Um, also, if you can't find it there, scrutinize your contract. And if they're not, Explicit about the rights you have, don't sign it. Um, the libraries can help you understand what rights to retain and what you would be okay giving away. Um, can you change your contract? Well, it's challenging to change a contract you've already signed. You can add an addendum to contracts you haven't signed yet that make it more clear what rights you would like to retain. Um, Spark has a really great and widely shared addendum you can find with a quick Google search and I will also share the link to that. And this is adjacent to author's rights, but I just wanted to mention it. Um, can you use your own copyrighted work? And it depends on what the publisher allows. Um, but if you're looking at a contract with a publisher now or in the near future, do your best to ensure it allows you to use your own work. After all, you created it. 
Um, a quick related note that I wanted to make sure is out there. Um, copyright infringement is totally different than plagiarism. They can both happen in one instance, which is really, really bad, um, but they can and do occur separately. And you should always cite yourself when necessary, and you should check your contracts, again, before you use material you created, because it might be under copyright. Um, how can you use copyrighted works, yours or otherwise? If you find a copyrighted work that you'd like to use, there are many avenues for you. Um, the first one is to consider fair use. And I'll talk about this more shortly, but fair use provides flexibility regarding the use of copyrighted materials in educational settings. This might be a good option for many at Toro because it is a nonprofit educational institution. Um, but again, I'll talk about it more in a second. Um, get permission. If you do not think you can make the case for fair use, you can seek permission to use a work in the way you would like. There are many online templates available for letters to send to publishers seeking this permission, but the key thing is to get absolutely everything in writing so you have proof you've been granted permission to use a material. Um, use something else. So this is a way to not use copyrighted work. Um, there are now so many open access materials and open educational resources that the chances are high you'll be able to find a comparable material with an open license or something in the public domain that fits your needs. Um, and again, we're happy to help you with this. Another important thing to remember, especially when using online resources like websites, is that just because you can read or access something for free does not mean that it's in the public domain and free for you to use. Um, assume something is protected by copyright until you are absolutely or very reasonably sure through the, one of the above means that it is not under copyright. Um, so I'm going to pause. Does anyone have any questions? Okay. I'm going to share it again. Okay. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about some of the checks on copyright. There are a few checks that favor the user and allow flexibility um, in some cases when using copyright work. So like I said at the beginning, it, copyright was created to favor the creator and to protect their interests, but it's also important to balance the user's needs. Um, so here are a couple of checks. Um, the first one is section 108. Um, libraries and archives has, have special copyright powers that come from this part of the U.S. code related to copyright. Broadly, this section provides expanded allowances for reproducing copyrighted works, um, which allows for preservation copies, and it also makes interlibrary loan possible. Um, I just wanted to mention a couple of specific things. All of Section 8 applies to Toro because we are a nonprofit. Um, an educational library that is open to like the required parties to the public or to researchers um, seeking special permission to use our uh, materials. Um, so for it, it governs unpublished works, published works, and interlibrary loan, as I mentioned. Um, for unpublished work, librarians can make up to three copies for preservation or for deposit in another library or archive that is open to the public or available to people doing specialized research. Um, if they have a copy of it and um, that it is kept in, on the premises or in the digital premises of the library and archives. Um, for published works, it's the same thing, um, but they can make a replacement copy um, or they can make another copy if the work it is stored in has become obsolete. So if you have like one of those films that like rolls like in a cartoon, <laughs> um, you can make a preservation or a replacement copy of something like that. Um, and then, yes, yeah, like I mentioned, ILL. And I'm going to skip that, all of the jargon there for time. But if you have questions about that, I do have the notes and we can talk about it. OK, another check is Creative Commons. And Creative Commons is another type of license. 
that Juliana, who previously held this position, called copyright's best friend, or at least their very close friend. Um, it's a set of licenses that support more free use and adaptation of public works because they are modular and they emphasize adaptation and reuse. Um, you can combine permissions to create a license that works best for your content, and they're often used with open educational resources. So you'll get this chart, um, and their website is just creativecommons.org, and they have a lot of information there. Um, but as you can see, it's made with a focus on reusing and sharing work. Um, so it is focused on the creator like copyright, but it's a collaborative creative process. Um, and the big check is fair use. Um, as I briefly mentioned earlier, fair use is a provision that allows for expanded use of copyrighted work. And it's a way to balance the creator and user, especially in educational settings. It relies on four factors which must be balanced to see whether a use is favored. Fair use is not a guarantee of protection and there is not a hard and fast rule about how to apply fair use rules to ensure that you can avoid copyright infringement. And I really, really, really wanna emphasize that. There's no right answer when it comes to fair use. Even if you make one analysis and assessment, a judge or the creator or anyone else might not make that same assessment. And it's no guarantee you're avoiding infringement. I can tell you that judgments tend to favor educational institutions who can show that they made a good faith effort to apply fair use when an aggrieved creator raises an issue. Um, so how do you determine if fair use applies? Um, and it goes back to those four factors I mentioned, and you can do an analysis with those. Those four factors are, one, the purpose and character of the use, including whether the use is of a commercial nature or for a nonprofit educational purpose. Two, the nature of the copyrighted work used. Three, the amount and substantiality of the portion used in relation to the copyrighted work as a whole. And four, the effect of the use upon the potential market for or value of the copyrighted work. Um, so to do a fair use four factors assessment, I first wanna um, remind you, I think I said this, you should write down your notes on each of these aspects um, because you wanna have clear documentation that you did this work, that you did make a good faith effort to do it. Um, and you're making your best estimate as to whether you fall on the fair use side of things. So in general, you're safe on the first factor if you're operating um, within Toro's purposes because we are a nonprofit educational um, institution. If you're operating outside of Toro and or using an artistic work, you should consider whether yours is a transformative use or one which adds something new with a further purpose or a different character. Um, as those transformative uses tend to be favored because they are all about um, fostering creativity and artistic endeavors. For factor two, you want to think about the type of work you are using. Is it artwork, a piece of literature? Um, that's kind of what you want to think about when it comes to the nature of the work. Um, for factor three, you want to use as little of the work as possible and you want to avoid using the heart of the work which is the meatiest or key part of the work. And that's related to factor four, which is asking you to consider whether your use will hurt the market value of the work. So for example, if you share the conclusion of a mystery novel, people are not going to want to buy it. So you've used the heart of the work and that's hurt its earning potential. Again, fair use is a guessing game at best, and it's definitely not a guarantee. The best thing to do I keep repeating this because it's really important, is to keep written records of your analyses and be prepared to defend your evaluation if it's called upon. Okay, so switching gears slightly, um, I just briefly want to talk about copyright in the physical classroom. When we go back to class, um, which I'm fingers crossed will be soon, um, we can definitely talk about it more if you have questions. But copyright in the physical classroom is pretty easy to understand because it's really liberal. If you are in person in a classroom at a nonprofit educational institution, again, that's Toro, you have broad rights to use copyrighted materials. Fair use can be used as extra, extra protection, but it is not likely you will need to defend most in-class uses of copyrighted materials in practice in a legal setting. 
um, because they really want to foster educational use. Where it gets a little trickier is um, teaching in online settings. But the TEACH Act, and that's really the acronym, um, <laughs> governs copyright in the online teaching setting. Um, and students still have pretty broad rights as long as you use your Canvas account or other protected access to copyrighted content you're sharing. Um, if you cannot do this, you can still cover yourself copyright-wise in online teaching, teaching environments by linking to documents or works instead of sharing them as attachments having students stream copyrighted content with their own accounts or otherwise on their own, and remembering that even if access is free, it is still likely copyrighted. Um, and I just want to make a few more notes on the Teach Act. Um, the portion you use in an online setting is significantly reduced versus an in-person setting. While, for example, you could show an entire audiovisual work in a face-to-face -face setting, you would only be able to show a clip, a quote, reasonable and limited portion online. And the Teach Act is intended mainly to cover performances like audiovisual works and dramatic works performed in an online class. So supplemental online reading, viewing, and listening materials are better governed and um, used by considering fair use. So again, it's kind of piecemeal. It really depends on the specific situation that you find yourself in, um, what part of copyright and what part of copyright you want to use and what will best protect you. Um, and again, if you have more questions on the teacher act, I have some notes on the specifics, so just let me know. Um, and I want to do a special note as we are in a crisis situation. Um, copyright right now continues to be largely the same, but as I've written on the slide, this is a crisis situation. And you might be able to, you might be able and compelled to make use of expanded fair use reasoning. Um, you might have seen a statement floating around. Well, we're not um, totally sure of the legal argument and basis for that statement. We are confident in saying that fair use um, should be considered to be expanded during this time. Um, but again, you should be making careful notes of your reasoning for that. Um, when you use it. Um, to make use of that expanded fair use reasoning in this time, I just want to re-emphasize the best practices we discussed um, that apply to other online teaching and copyright use. Um, use links instead of sharing copies of documents. Document your reasoning. Protect scans and uploads and password protected Canvas courses. And finally, make use of library resources, which are still um, often copyrighted, but they are accessible through a password protected database or a proxy accessible database. So that's a safer bet. Um, you can also use OER and public domain materials. And of course, ask librarians for help. Okay, so we are almost to the questions part, but I just wanted to summarize what we talked about. By going over two frequently asked questions in a sample scenario. More of these can be found on our library guide, which I'll also show you in one second. Um, but if you would like to answer any of these questions, please feel free to unmute yourself and give it a try. Um, so the first one is really a review. Um, can you use copyrighted materials on Canvas? What about on a class website? Um, okay, I can't tell if anyone is unmuting themselves, so I'm just going to answer it. Um, you can most usually, most often use copyrighted materials on a password protected Canvas account, so long as it's strictly limited to your class. Um, if you cannot use a password protected Canvas account and you have, for example, a public website, you should not be posting copyrighted materials there unless you have obtained explicit permission um, to post them there, um, or they are links out to password protected sites or um, some other way of ensuring that access is limited. Um, are images that you find on the internet under copyright, 
can you use them in your teaching? And if anyone wants to unmute, you can go ahead and do that. I can't see the chat, so I don't know if anyone's there. Uh, this is Annette. I'll say yes, you can. Uh, they are copyrighted. Images on the internet are copyrighted. Some. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, you are right. You should definitely assume that they are copyrighted, whether they are on the internet or not. Um, in face-to-face -face teaching, you can display lawfully obtained images. Um, in other cases, you should apply fair use to determine whether you can use an image in your teaching or whether you need to ask permission. Um, you may specifically want to look for public domain images or images with Creative Commons licensing, which you can do on Google. You can search for those specifically. Um, okay, and the last one is a scenario. A teacher copies a Shakespearean play from a copyrighted anthology and shares it with her class. Can she do that legally? This is Annette again. I'm going to say no because it's a derivative. Um, so she actually is able to share the play because this is a tricky one. It was a trick question. Um, the play was written by Shakespeare, so it's super old um, and it is in the public domain. Um, the anthology itself is copyrighted. So if she wanted to share that whole anthology, including original commentary or things like that, um, it would probably be considered copyright infringement. But the play itself is in the public domain. Okay. Um, so I just wanted, before we do questions, to mention the Copyright LibGuide. Um, it is just libguides.torolib slash copyright. We've updated that recently. Um, there's also online specific things there, which might be helpful. Um, and when I send out the slides, this link will be live. So you're definitely welcome to check it out then. Um, okay, so now I'm going to stop sharing it and take questions. Um, but before I do, sorry, I just wanted to do another reminder just to cover all the bases that this presentation was not legal advice and it was for informational purposes only. Um, but now I will stop sharing. And if you have questions, we can talk about them. Or comment. Either is fine. Um, I have a question. Uh, Google Images, there is a way of searching Google Images where you can get uh, free, well, not free, uh, copyright, not copyrighted material. Sorry, clocks. <laughs> um, What's the best way to search Google Images for images that are not copyrighted? Um, I'm going to share my screen and show you how to do it. So So I'm just on Google Images. If I search for CAS, which is my go-to, um, then you can go to is it tools, it's tools, and then usage rights, and then you can see here, um, labeled for reuse without mod with modification, reuse, non-commercial reuse, um, with modification and non-commercial reuse. Um, and they're all for different things, but for Toro, since we are non-commercial reuse, you should be able to use any of them and find um, sources that work. Um, the only thing you need to be careful of is the modification part, but if you're just going to share it, then that shouldn't be a problem. And you can also go to the Creative Commons website, and you can find images here. Search for CC images. Um, so those are two options. Did you mention, I, I had some technical difficulties there for a few minutes. Did you mention anything about YouTube? Say, for instance, I wanted to use Kaltura and clip a TED talk and put that into something in Toro Lectures. Um, so I didn't. YouTube has a couple of licenses. They do have Creative Commons licensed videos, so that might be an option. I'm not sure specifically what TED Talks does, 
um, but I would assume they don't use that. Um, I think your best bet is to either link out to the video so you don't have to worry about it at all. Um, and if students are accessing it on their own, that's like another way to avoid copyright infringement. Um, or if you are recording it in like a Kaltura video and then just having it on um, Canvas and like really making sure it's locked down, I think you would be in the clear, but it, like the best thing to do would be to link out. So what I often do is I use the Kaltura quiz builder and I can't get with anybody because of COVID-19 face to face to videotape any patient scenarios in healthcare. So I'm using as many videos as I can off of YouTube and I'm using quiz building. So I'm modifying the video by putting in quizzes into the video from the YouTube videos. And I'm wondering if I'm stretching things there. Um, I'm not sure. Sarah, are you still on? Do you want to yeah. try to answer that one? Yeah. Um, I'm also not sure, but we can double check for you. Uh, we can get back to you. Yeah, I don't want to say something which is then, you know, not correct. So I will double check and we, we, we get back to you just to be on the safe side. Yeah. Um, does anyone have other questions? And you said you will share all the websites also that you mentioned, right, uh, Georgia? Like Spark and yeah. Romeo and Sherpio and I always want to say Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> that, that fair use um, tab slide that you had up, we'll be able to find that. Is that what Sarah's saying? Yes, I'm planning to send out the recording of this, the slides, and then link to everything I mentioned. Um, that LibGuide has most of the stuff that I mentioned, and I will highlight that link. All right. And I see, um, David, do you have um, a comment? All right. OK. I see. All right. I just uh, want to note if anybody's uh, has a um, interested in the analog in Jewish law, um, the copyright. Uh, I I send on chat a link uh, in which usually four categories are mentioned of Haskat Gavu, um, which literally in in the Chumash and the Pentateuch is about somebody who has a boundary and puts their boundary on somebody else's land and essentially steals their land. Um, and um, the rabbis apply that analogously to, um, quote, stealing somebody's configuration of ideas or plagiarism. And, and there, there are other categories as well, which I won't mention. But um, I've always wondered, you know, with a work like the uh, Talmudim, the Jerusalem and Babylonian Talmud, um, on, on every page, there's no sense of authorship. Um, it's a collective work. It is true the, the Gemara might have been redacted by Rabashi and, and Rava and the Mishnah by Rabbi Yehuda and Nasi only during a crisis time when it was thought that these ideas and traditions might be lost in forgetfulness. Um, but the notion of authorship, um, according to recent postmodern thinkers like Michel Foucault, is, is really a function of um, the late Middle Ages and particularly bourgeois culture um, of intellectual property right. And, and Foucault wrote an essay, Qu'est-ce que c'est un auteur? What is an author? And he shows that ancient writings, even though there are countless examples, yes, uh, Marcus Aurelius authored this, or Seneca authored this, and Aristotle's writing in this, and, and Plato's this, a lot of dialogues this. Um, for rabbinic culture, it was um, a lot of emphasis on a collective project of, of a multitude of voices uh, that through a redaction process, um, you know, on one page of the, the Talmud, you could have 
um, a Tana with an Amora roughly 500 years apart, but they're in dialogue. So the author um, is not something that's egotistical or solipsistically self-referential, but a collective process of a community. And it always, I have a question in my mind. Yes, the rabbis certainly affirm that you don't want to be deceitful and steal other people's ideas and the configurations they put them in. Um, but if you look at a particular uh, psalm in Tehillim, there's one that where King David says, uh, your ideas to me, O oh God, are very precious. And, um, and that's a radical idea that um, eternal ideas nobody owns. As Native American Indians say, nobody owns the horizon. And whether this is really, a, I don't know, it's a question. And whether Foucault's right, I don't know. Um, whether uh, particularly the rise of the bourgeois class post the French Revolution and elsewhere um, gave rise to particularly strong notions of intellectual property. They certainly exist before then in the Middle Ages in the Gemara. You know, they use the metaphor, one rabbi who says they have a fishing net and somebody's trolling and putting bait in the water and he uh, coaxes the other fish to come into his net and is that like stealing somebody's ideas or something? That's under the category of Hashkama. But um, so it certainly goes back a long way before the rise of the middle class. But it, it, the Foucault is pointing out that it's fetishized by middle class culture, bourgeois culture. And, um, and, and with a work like the, the Talmud, uh, it, it seems to be more of a collective work of a multitude of voices uh, where nobody points to, I authored this. Um, it, it is, it is a, a, a testimony to spanning uh, many, many millennia on one page. Uh, and so, so I'm, I'm wondering if it's uh, the, the emphasis on copyright, cert, certainly we don't want to pass off one's ideas for other people's formulations. Um, and certain things are standard that Paris is the capital of France and you don't need to cite that and so forth. But um, whether really this has become particularly uh, acute in bourgeois culture, uh, where intellectual property uh, is um, given utmost importance um, because ultimately nobody owns eternal ideas. They were invented by an eternal deity who's perfect, self-sufficient, not so, and, David, yeah. sorry to interrupt you, but I think maybe the Creative Commons is sort of like uh, bringing us back to uh, the original ideas and like more sharing uh you know and taking us away taking us back to less copyright um rules and regulations and the sharing of ideas more than uh we, we are doing right now so i think maybe your answer is like you know getting back to creative commons would be a good thing but um carol has uh, something that she also wanted to add yes carol i just wanted to say david you're an author how would you like someone taking your stuff uh, I mean, I don't, yes, I don't look at myself as an author. Um, I, uh, you've written a lot of things. You've written a lot of things. You know, there's a, you're an I, author. I hope that I aspire. I know I'm just like a nothing, but you know, there's a difference between a researcher and an author. An author, you know, employs the techniques of rhetoric and 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 certain skills in, in creative writing and. But and if someone took political. your words verbatim, and even if it's not authorship, you're reviewing a book. And you've done a lot of those things, but someone takes your exact words and uses them. You wouldn't like it. I actually I don't mind it, but um, Maimonides, for instance, was faulted in Lahabdil Shemid David Alevi. I'm not Maimonides. He was faulted for not citing his sources in the Mishnah Torah, and um, it was later Rav Yosef Karo and Ketzav Mishnah, for instance, and other commentaries that would pick up these these sources. So um, I'm not saying the Rambam was against copyright. He's not. It's just, um, it's food for thought whether um, there's a historicity to uh, certain emphasis in, in certain even legal ideas um, of copyright. So I don't want to detract us as, as Sarah says, it's just uh, some more, um, um, you know, f thought about the yeah, subject. Absolutely. I, I wanted to make a comment too, yeah, go actually ahead. along the lines of what David was saying about um, like the idea of, I guess, property, intellectual property and copyright. And um, just getting back to what uh, Georgia had mentioned about 
there's a circular kind of floating around in the COVID times of, you know, how do we make use of fair use during this emergency situation? And that kind of lays bare, um, not necessarily competing factions, but the different factions and attitudes of legal scholars around copyright. Should there be stricter protections? How long should the protections last? And if you look at the history of copyright, even in our country, you know, it's, it's gone from a 14-year period to a 28-year period to a 70-year period of length. Um, and even further back, you know, it's evolved from the, the British system of um, the, the printing presses and who had the exclusive right to print a book in an age of extreme poverty, uh, piracy. So uh, I just wanted to echo that, you know, especially with fair use, it's sort of like um, there are different le legal opinions and they come back to different, I guess, personal opinions about how much should be shared and how much belongs to the individual. Uh, and I guess the one quote that I like is um, um, scholar at Cornell, uh, Peter Hurdle. He says that the, the best part about copyright is that it expires. So, I mean, he's obviously more of an extreme uh, public domain uh, advocate, but I think it's interesting to consider, as David said, the history of it and the fact that now in the COVID times, in, the, in a pandemic and a crisis, you know, you're seeing different moves by different parties trying to uh, move copyright law in a certain direction. Fascinating. Fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. There's a wonderful book by Anthony Grafton called The History of the Footnote or something like that. And he argues and I think shows pretty demonstrably that the footnote, even though Bella Huss Weinberger argues that the indexes were a forerunner of it that existed in the early Middle Ages, in indexes such as uh, Ein Mishpat uh, Ner Mitzvah, which is in the upper right of the Talmud page, which is an index, a cross-reference of where the subjects dealt with elsewhere. But um, the footnote as a big deal became very prevalent in the Enlightenment period in the 1700s. And people like Ben Johnson and uh, really celebrated this format. Um, and, and the footnote, of course, is often, one, one form it can take is, is attributing ideas to other authors. Um, and Grafton suggests that uh, the footnote really took off in, quote, popularity in the Enlightenment modern times. All right, thank you. Um, anyone has thank any you. other questions, Carol? Um, um, Georgia? <laughs> I just have one more. I have like a really stupid question. Uh, YouTube. Uh, there are YouTubes that are um, allowed to be used in Creative Commons? Yes, there is a YouTube license and there's a Creative Commons license and then there are more strict copyrights. Um, I'm not that familiar with how to search, but I would assume since it's a Google platform, there's a similar way to search. Um, for those resources, but you can also do a search from the Creative Commons website, which might be easiest. Okay, thank you. All right. This was useful. Thank you, Georgia. Thank you, terrific. Yeah. Thank you, Georgia. Thank you. You can always email me too. Um, yeah, thanks all for coming. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I'll yeah. go find the uh, Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Bye now. Bye. Bye. Bye.